before recognizing Dr. Paul for his statement, I want to note that uh, this may be his last uh, last uh, committee meeting with the chairman of the Fed, Federal Reserve. Uh, and throughout his time in office, uh, Dr. Paul has been a consistent and strong uh, advocate for sound monetary policy and his leadership on the committee, especially during these hearings when we've had the Federal Reserve Chairman appear before us, uh, have certainly made the hearings more interesting and uh, provided several memorable YouTube moments. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, could I unite my consent just to say that having served for a long time with Ron Paul, with whom I agree on, on a number of issues, uh, I am very pleased that I was able to serve one term with him as the chairman because there were times during our joint service when despite his seniority, I thought he'd never get to it. So I'm glad that he finally achieved that chairmanship that he should have had long ago. Thank you. Thank you. Your comments, uh, uh, chairman and the ranking member. But I am delighted to be here today, but I just want to refresh a few people's memory. I was first elected to Congress in 1976 in April in a special election, and the biggest bill on docket at that time was the revamping of the IMF. There was a major crisis going on from the breakdown of the Bretton Woods Agreement, and they had to rewrite the laws. They wanted to conform the laws with what they had been doing for five years, and that was a, a major piece of legislation. But it was only a consequence of what was predicted in 1945, because when 1945 established the Bretton Woods, it was predicted by the free market economists it wouldn't work, it would fail, and this whole idea that they could uh, uh, regulate exchange rates and deal with the balance of payments, it, it totally failed. And so they had to come up with something new in 1971, 76, is that transition period. And uh, those same economists at that time said this was an unworkable system too, and it would lead to a major crisis of too much debt, too much malinvestment. It would be worldwide, it would be worse than anything because it would be based on the fiat dollar globally, and that uh, many of the problems that we have domestically would be worldwide. And that certainly has been confirmed with the crisis that we're in, and has not been resolved yet. We're still uh, floundering around, and we still have a long way to go. Um, I have, over the years, obviously been critical of, uh, of what goes on on monetary policy, but it hasn't been so much the chairman of the, of the committee, of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve, whether it was Paul Volcker or, or Alan Greenspan or the current uh, chairman, it's always been the system. I think they have an, a, a job that they can't do because it's an unmanageable job and it's a, <clears throat> it's a fallacy, it's, a, it's, it's a, a flawed system and therefore we shouldn't expect good results and, <clears throat> and generally we are not uh, getting results. Policies, policies never change. We stay the same thing. No matter what crisis is, we still do more of the same. If, if, <clears throat> if spending and debt was the problem, Spending more and in greater debt and have the Fed just buy more debt doesn't seem to help at all. And here we are doing the same thing. We, we don't talk about uh, the work ethic and true productions and true savings and, and uh, why this excessive debt uh, is so bad for us. We, we talk about solving a, uh, a worldwide problem of insolvency of nations, including our own, by just printing money, creating credit. And now the Fed, in the last uh, four years, tripled the monetary base, and it has uh, 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 a trillion dollars more money sitting there. The banks are sitting with trillions of dollars. And just the creation of money doesn't restore the confidence that is necessary. And until we get to the bottom of this and restore the confidence, uh, I don't think uh, we're going to see economic growth. This, this whole idea that you have the job of managing money and we can't even define the dollar. Nobody has a definition of the dollar. It's an impossible task. So I have hoped in the past to try to contribute to the discussion on monetary policy, the business cycle, and why it benefits the rich over the poor. And uh, so far, my views have not prevailed, but I've uh, appreciated the opportunity, and I appreciate this opportunity to have served on the Bank Committee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank Chairman Bernanke for appearing at today's hearing. Let me also uh, publicly thank uh, our Chairman, Dr. Paul, for his honorable service in Congress and to his country. 
right. Dr. Paul, for three, for five minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a question prepared, but I think I better follow up on the question you asked, uh, uh, Chairman Bernanke, dealing with the audit of the Fed. Uh, because when, when the Fed talks about independence, what they're really talking about is, is uh, secrecy, not, uh, uh, not transparency. And it's the secrecy that I don't like and that we have a right to know about. What, what the GAO uh, cannot audit, and, uh, and I believe it would be the position of the chairman, is it cannot audit monetary policy, and you expressed yourself on monetary policy, but it would not be able to look at agreements and operations with foreign central banks and governments and other banks, or transactions made under direction of the FOMC, discussions or communications between the board and the Federal Reserve System related to all those items. <clears throat> so it really, it's, uh, it's, it's really not an audit with, without this. It's still secrecy. And why this is important is because of what happened four years ago. Uh, it's estimated that the amount of money that went in and out of the Fed for the bailing out uh, uh, overseas was $15 trillion. Well, how did we ever get into this situation where Congress has nothing to say about trillions and trillions of dollars of bailing out certain banks and governments through these currency swaps? And the chairman has publicly announced that he's available. There's a crisis going on in Europe. Part of this dollar crisis going on that's been building, it's unique to the history of the world and monetary policy. And we stand ready. Who stands ready? The American taxpayer, because we're just gonna print up the money. As long as they take our dollars, we'll print the money and we'll bail them all out and we're gonna destroy the middle class. The middle class is shrinking. The banks get richer, the middle class gets shrink, they shrink, they lose their houses, they lose their mortgages. This system is biased against the middle class and the poor. So I would say that th this is, uh, if, if we protect this amount of secrecy, it is not good policy and it's not good, uh, uh, good economics at all, and it's very unfair. But my question is, Mr. Chairman, uh, whose responsibility is it under the Constitution to manage monetary policy? What, uh, which branch of government has the absolute authority to manage monetary policy? The Congress has the authority, and it's delegated to the Federal Reserve. That's a policy decision that you made. Yeah, but they can't transfer authority. Um, you can't amend the Constitution by just saying we're going to create some secret group of individuals and banks. That's amending the Constitution. You can't do that and all of a sudden allow this to exist in secrecy. And who's, whose responsibility is it uh, uh, for uh, oversight? Which branch of government has, a, has the right of oversight? Congress has the right of oversight, and we certainly fully accept that, and, are, and, I, and we fully accept the need for transparency and accountability. Um, but it is a, uh, a well-established fact that an independent central bank will provide better uh, outcomes um, if you want to go. At, there's no constitutional reason why, you couldn't, why Congress couldn't just take over monetary policy. Um, if you want to do that, I guess that's your right to do it, but I'm advising you that it wouldn't be very good from an economic policy point of view. Yeah, but if, if it's allowed to be done in secret, this is the reason why I want to work within the system. What I want to say is Congress ought to get a backbone. They ought to say we deserve to know, we have a right to know, we have an obligation to know because we have an obligation to defend our currency. It's the destruction of the currency that des des destroys the middle class. There is a principle in free market banking that says if you destroy the value of currency through inflation, you transfer the wealth from the middle class and it gravitates to the very wealthy. The bankers, the government, the politicians, they all love this. It is, it is the fact that the Federal Reserve is the facilitator but you couldn't have big government. If everybody loves big government, love the Fed, because they can finance the wars and all the welfare you want, but it doesn't work. It eventually ends up in a crisis, and it's a solvency crisis, and it can't be solved by printing a whole lot of money. So I think the very first step is transparency, and for us to know, we have a right to know, and you may be correct in your assumption, at least I'm sure you believe this, but maybe I should be talking to the Congress that we should stand up and say, yes, we demand to know. Trillions and trillions of dollars being printed out of thin air and bailing out their friends, they stand ready to do it. The crisis is just, in its, as far as I'm concerned, my opinion is it's in the early stages. It's far from over. We're in deep doldrums and we'd never change policy. 
We never challenge anything. We just keep doing the same thing. Congress keeps spending the money. Welfare expands exponentially. Wars never end. And deficits don't matter. And when it comes to cutting spending, Republicans and Democrats to get together and say, oh, no, we, we can't really cut. And if we do cut, we just cut proposed Mr. increases. Chairman, regular order. You stand Thanks there. You. you stand regular there order, Mr. And, Chairman. And, and, and facilitate it all. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Sustainability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Bernanke, thank you for being here. I want to say two of my worst votes in 18 years, the Iraq war, we didn't have to go to Iraq, and the second, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. And uh, if I was not going to yield my time, I would ask you about reinstating Glass-Steagall. I think I will write you a letter with that question, sir. But at this time, because he's one of my dearest friends, I supported him for the Republican nomination to be President of the United States. I yield my time to Dr. Ron Paul. I uh, thank the gentleman from uh, North Carolina. I wanted to make a very brief statement about our previous discussion about the audit the Fed bill. <clears throat> that bill has nothing to do with transferring who does monetary policy. This was, it's strictly a transparency bill. Monetary policy reform, I believe, will come, but that's another subject. This is just to know more about what the Federal Reserve is doing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one of your key points that you've made through your academic career as well as being a defend has been the need to prevent deflation. Would you agree with that? that is Generally, yes, sir. Right. And that uh, you, you argue that the Depression was prolonged by uh, the Federal Reserve not being able to reinflate. So in that sense, I think you really have achieved, uh, you've had the chance, you were uh, put in a situation that uh, you alone didn't create. It's, to, as far as I'm concerned, the system created and, and other managers uh, helped create this. And uh, there was this, uh, what I see as a natural tendency to deflate and liquidate and clear the market. And, uh, and, and under your philosophy, you say, well, we can't allow this to happen. We have to uh, prevent it. And I would say you've done a pretty good job. You know, the, M, uh, the monetary base has been tripled. And in the last 12 months, I think M, uh, M1 has grown about 16 percent, M2 at, uh, over 9 percent. So it seems to be like a monetary system, the monetary uh, uh, numbers are, are still growing. But the, uh, the how, pricing houses, you know, everybody knows there's a bubble. I like to believe that the free market economists knew about it and predicted it, others did not. But uh, the uh, prices soared up, everybody knows there was a bubble and then they collapsed. When those prices of houses collapsed, do you call that deflation? No. Uh, deflation is uh, prices of current goods and services. Uh, so inflation, inflation doesn't capture house prices. It includes the house or the uh, rental. Okay. And I think one of the problems, even getting a, a full-fledged discussion out, is sometimes a definition of words about mm -hmm. what inflation and deflation means. Because as far as I'm concerned, deflation is when the money supply shrinks. And inflation is when the money supply expands. But just about everybody in the country, especially the financial markets and the way I think the conventional use of inflation is the CPI. And I think it's, you know, a lousy measurement because if it's the money supply increase, if prices going down is, of houses is not deflation, wonder why it is that inflation is measured by the CPI going up rather than the money supply going up. Our argument is that once you distort interest rates and increase the supply of money, you end up uh, with this gross distortion that is demanding, uh, demanding some uh, uh, correction. So I would, I, I've worked on this for years, and we're not going to solve it today. The definitions would be much better if, we, if, if prices of houses going down is not deflation, then the CPI going up shouldn't be uh, in inflation. But, We've had trouble five years. The monetary system, you say, this is not all end to end all. You can't solve every problem with monetary system and monetary uh, policy. We've had this for five years and we're still in a mess. Is there ever a time, let's say we go five more years and we have the same problems but much worse, is there ever a time you might say, I have to reassess my philosophy on monetary policy or do you think... Uh, it'll be the same no matter what kind of crisis. Can you foresee any kind of problem that we would have that you would reassess your assumptions? Uh, I, I can't conjecture what specifically, but of course, yeah, I'm evidence-based. I look at see what happens and try to draw conclusions from that. 
certainly. Well, the, um, the, the, the definitions obviously t to me are, you know, very, very important. And um, if, if we don't come to this conclusion and we use these terms, I inflation demands corrections and, uh, and, the co and the market wants to correct. So this is why we believe th that you're, we're going to have perpetual doldrums and, and, uh, and finally have a big one. Do you consider this, this recession that we're facing today s something that is significantly different since 1945? Much worse and different in any way? Yes, because of the financial crisis, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, that was a double dose you got. So uh, that was pleasantly unexpected, I guess.